Hi, everybody. I'm, I'm Rob Wells. Welcome to the Roy Reed Lecture, 2021 Roy Reed Lecture. I'm joined this evening by uh, Dr. Uh, Karee Benton, the director of the African and African American Studies Program, a co-sponsor of this evening's event. I think this is the first time that uh, journalism and African and African American studies have uh, collaborated on, a, on an event. Is, is that right, Dr. Ben? That is indeed right. And we're happy to be a part of this great event with journalism. Well, great. Well, thanks for being here. Why don't you tell the, the group a little bit about the program and, uh, and uh, what, uh, what we might be cooking up uh, next, uh, next semester. Great, thank you all so very much for uh, tuning in tonight. Um, as uh, Dr. Wells said, I am the director of the African and African American Studies uh, program here at the University of Arkansas, where we, uh, we are truly invested in providing an interdisciplinary education um, to our students, um, engaging with a multiplicity of uh, disciplines from history, political science, journalism, social work, uh, education, and so on. Uh, we uh, invite students to uh, you know, double major or minor in uh, AST um, to adopt AST as a second major. Um, a total of 21 hours um, would be needed uh, to, to become an additional, you know, have AST as a, as a second major uh, or dependent major if you're in certain fields. And then for a minor, uh, a total of uh, 15 hours in African African American studies. So I would invite you if you um, haven't done an audit of perhaps courses you've already taken, you might already have a substantial number of those courses already fulfilled. So uh, we invite you, we have a study abroad program to Ghana that, uh, you know, unfortunately with COVID, we couldn't go last year and we're still holding off um, until 2023. So again, um, if you're a major or minor, um, those are some of the things that you, you can take uh, advantage of. And lastly, I'll mention that for those of you who are in the journalism graduate uh, program, we do have the graduate certificate program, uh, which uh, you know, requires a total of 15 hours, but nine of those hours can be in your own program. And then one interdisciplinary um, course and a core course that we offer in African and African-American studies in, in, in graduate readings in African and African American studies. So we invite you all to, you know, come over to African and African American studies. I think it's a valuable part of a, a university education. And so uh, if you have any questions, please uh, shoot me an email at C-A-B-A-N-T-O-N at uart.edu. Yeah, please put your email in, in the chat, Dr. Ben. Oh, sure. That'd be great. Yeah. And, uh, you know, as graduate coordinator for journalism, uh, we're gonna be, uh, sending a lot of uh, students your way. It's, uh, this is the sort of cultural competency that journalists need. I mean, and, and we have such a, a great uh, program and, a, and an awesome partner. So uh, thank you, thank so you much. very, very much for, for being here. Um, so I just wanted to uh, have a couple housekeeping matters here before I introduce the speaker. Uh, events being recorded, you're all being muted. Um, and, but we do encourage you to post questions in the chat and I'll monitor the chat. Um, so I'm just very proud and honored to, to introduce uh, my friend and my mentor, uh, Dr. Kathy Roberts Ford as the 2021 Roy Reed speaker. Uh, Dr. Ford is Associate Professor of Journalism and the Associate Dean of Equity and Inclusion at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. And she has served as chair of the UMass Journalism Department from 2014 to 2017, and is the former chair of the AEJMC History Division, and also um, a uh, past uh, associate editor of American Journalism, which is one of the main uh, journals in our uh, journalism history in our field. She holds a, a master's degree in English and literature from uh, Middlebury College and a PhD in mass communications and media studies from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, her book, Literary Journalism on Trial, um, Mason versus New Yorker and the First Amendment 
received the Frank Luther Mott KTA Book Award and the AJMC History Division Book Award. So basically a sweep in our field for when you write a book, it's uh, in, in journalism history, those are the top honors you're gonna be uh, getting. Uh, quick aside, I, I first met Dr. Ford when I was a visiting professor down at the University of South Carolina when I was just starting my career as a, my new career as a journalism professor. He's been a great ally and uh, a mentor and is now the editor of my uh, forthcoming book on the University of Massachusetts Press. So just, uh, it's been a wonderful professional and uh, friend, a great friendship over this, this time. She's speaking to us tonight, you know, as we in the nation are, are experiencing this, this major moment in race relations in our country. You know, as journalists, we're playing this essential role in the portrayal of the Black Lives Matter movement or the, the portrayal of what's happening in the courtroom in the, in the trial of uh, Derek Chauvin and the murder of George Floyd. The words and images that we use to report these events, you know, do we call it a riot? Do we call it an uprising? Was it murder or was it an officer acting in self-defense? These editorial decisions shape our public perception and shape political response. So Dr. Ford is gonna argue that journalists are not neutral actors in these events. And we really need to re-examine this myth of journalistic neutrality. She makes this bold argument in her new book, Journalism and Jim Crow, The Making of White Supremacy in the New South, which is co-authored by Sid Bedingfield of the uh, University of Minnesota. I'll just read a little excerpt here from the book. Uh, Ford and Bedingfield write in the introduction that uh, when political historians have taken journalism seriously as an agent of change, they have emphasized the soft power that news media exerts through its contributions to public discourse. And they've often ignored the hard power wielded by journalists. The hard power that journalists have, have wielded, they've formed alliances with political and industrial and financial leaders who've operated uh, much as leaders themselves. So Dr. Ford's writing about race and race in the South makes her an ideal speaker for the Roy Reed lecture series. I know many students may not know about uh, Roy Reed. He uh, was one of the top New York Times reporters in the 1960s and 1970s. He had this very vivid reporting of the civil rights uh, 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 battles. He was on the scene of the uh, Selma Bloody Sunday March. That reporting really captured the attention of the nation. Roy Reed was the best journalist to ever come out of Arkansas. And he lived just down the road in a little town called Hogeye. I don't even think you can really call it Hogeye, but it, call Hogeye a town. It's, it's an intersection basically. And he taught journalism here from 1979 to 1995 and he uh, passed away 2017. I was just really honored to be able to spend some time with, with Roy Reed and, and got to know him a little bit before um, his passing. Roy was a straight news journalist, you know, but he knew his work had impact. And that impact and the political implications of journalism are, are what Dr. Ford is here to discuss this evening. So I'll turn the program over to, to Dr. Ford. Really happy to have you and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to the School of Journalism and Strategic Media for inviting me to speak. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Wells, for that lovely introduction and for your friendship and colleagueship colleagueship these many years. And thank you, Dr. Bar Banton, um, for uh, that wonderful call out for your program. And I urge all students in the journalism program to do exactly as she said, please take courses in the African and African American Studies uh, Department there at the University of Arkansas. And um, it's important. Um, and I want to thank everyone who's attending one more Zoom event during what's been a crushing semester of work on every college campus in America. I am so honored and pleased to give a lecture named for Roy Reed, whose coverage of the heroic Black struggle for civil and political rights in the South was dramatized in Ava DuVernay's masterpiece film, Selma. So if you want to meet him just a little bit, even if it's in, uh, it's not him, but a character, um, representing him, watch that film. 
And also a quick point of connection with some of you, maybe my cousin, Ashley Ralph Ford is one of the architects who designed the stunning Adohi Hall uh, student residence on your campus. So if any of you get to live or will be living in that space, um, my cousin played a role in that. Um, I'm just so proud of her and y'all are really lucky <laughs> to have such a beautiful building on your campus. Um, also, I wanna say, I wish I could somehow evaporate all these screens we're sitting in front of right now so we could all be together in conversation and in a fellowship about these urgent issues we'll be thinking and talking about tonight. But still, I can't do that, but still here we are and I'm grateful we can be together safely in this way. And before I get rolling, I want to acknowledge that this book, Journalism and Jim Crow that Dr. Wells talked about, it's the work of many people. Uh, it's a, I'm the lead editor, but it is an edited book. And my co-editor, Sid Bedingfield, and the many brilliant historians who contributed chapters are all part of, of this project. From the beginning, our team has worked really closely, shaping this original and powerful revision, we think, of the prevailing historical narrative um, uh, about the South and the press during this time period and the Black freedom struggle. And we have shared our work in progress at a symposium hosted at the University of Minnesota several years ago. And so all of this is a way of saying that my remarks tonight are beholden to my fellow historians and friends who all contributed to the book. So journalism and Jim Crow tackles a subject about which relatively little was known. And this is the world of Southern, jour Southern journalism after the Civil War and Reconstruction from 1875 to 1920 when white Democrats gained political control of the South and built a nearly monolithic, anti-democratic, anti-black, violent, totalitarian society. That's just the truth. And this society stood until the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, when black Southerners finally wrested power from white supremacists during the civil rights movement. Let me be clear, after the Civil War and Reconstruction, powerful white newspaper publishers and editors across the South were often straight out, full on political actors. Today, news editors and publishers stay far away from political involvement, or at least that's the professional standard. But in the mid to late 19th century in the South, they were deeply involved in party politics and they were essential architects and builders of white supremacy. Let me underscore this point, which is at the heart of this fresh historical understanding we're offering in journalism and Jim Crow. These white newspaper publishers and editors in the South actively planned, built and protected white supremacist political economies and social orders across the South that lasted for generations and used anti-Black political violence as a weapon along the way. Black editors and journalists, South and North, fought these regimes as they were being built, creating newspapers, magazines, and civil rights organizations to enjoin the battle. They saw clearly what was happening as it was happening, and they called it out and fought ferociously to stop it. And the stakes could not have been higher. The future of liberal democracy, a truly inclusive and multiracial democracy in the newly restored United States was on the line. This book of ours documents this pitched battle between two different journalisms, a white journalism dedicated to building an anti-black, anti-democratic America and a black journalism dedicated to building a multiracial, fully democratic new America. The Southern white press and its political and business allies carried the day, effectively killing democracy in the South for nearly a century and crafting a racial hierarchy that inflected modern America and endures in some ways today. We all know, we've all learned to say, we've all come to understand in really painful ways that white supremacy is a built system that systemic and structural racism continue to exist across American institutions like policing, 
the criminal justice system, the corporate world, higher education, and importantly for my talk tonight, the news media. American democracy simply cannot work well within a news media system that is overwhelmingly white, which is the reality today. And we can draw a straight line from the history I'm discussing tonight in our present situation. This is an idea I'll return to, but first, some history. So after the Civil War, formerly enslaved persons took their freedom and began building their own communities, rebuilding families that had been torn apart by slavery, engaging in political activity, educating themselves and their children, learning how to participate in the market economy. By any measure, these Black Americans made incredible progress across Reconstruction, and there were millions. And that was that period, just to remind you of Reconstruction, of 12 years or so after the Civil War, when the federal government reconstructed the political and social worlds of the South. And of critical importance to Black Americans, both North, North and South, were the three Reconstruction era amendments to the US Constitution. Let me remind you of these. I know you've learned it before, but just a reminder. The 13th Amendment forbade slavery and involuntary servitude. Uh, and thus, for the very first time, introduced the word slavery to the Constitution and dismantled an institution that had been central to the American way of life long before and long after the country's founding. The 14th Amendment granted citizenship to all persons born or naturalized in the United States and promised equal protection under the law, laying waste the U.S. Supreme Court's infamous Dred Scott ruling that Black people in the United States could not be citizens. So the 14th Amendment granted citizenship to formerly enslaved persons and protection under the law. And the 15th Amendment guaranteed the right to vote to all citizens, regardless of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. So the nation's charter had been remade with these amendments to the Constitution to include Black Americans in the collective project of democracy. The destruction of slavery, the granting of citizenship, the promise of equal protection under the law, the guarantee of the right to vote, these constellations of rights enshrined in the Constitution were, as a historian Eric Foner has powerfully argued, a second founding for our country. With these amendments, the United States was born again as a multiracial liberal democracy that incorporated Black American men into the democratic project. Quick parenthesis, we all know women had to wait until the 19th Amendment was ratified in 1920. Only five years after the 15th Amendment came into being in 1875, when Reconstruction was still in place in the South, the white power structure of the state of Mississippi, Arkansas's close neighbor, came up with a plan to make that amendment and its promise of voting rights meaningless. It was called the Mississippi Plan. And its architect was the white editor of the Jackson Clarion, Mississippi's leading newspaper and mouthpiece of the Democratic Party, which was back then the party of white supremacy. The Clarion editor's name was Ethelbert Barksdale, and he joined forces with Democratic Party leader James Z. George to decimate the 15th Amendment in Mississippi. Here was their plan. Devise and execute a Democratic Party campaign of anti-Black rhetoric and terrorist violence to suppress the Black vote in state elections and replace Republican with Democratic rule and overwhelm Reconstruction in the South. They orchestrated a coordinated campaign of newspaper commentary, voter fraud, vicious, vicious guerrilla warfare against the black community designed to overthrow so-called Negro rule in the state, including militias that attacked black communities, burned their homes and murdered their men. Black Mississippians raised their voices and tried to stop the plan. The Republican governor of Mississippi pleaded with President Grant to send federal troops to stop the slaughter, but Grant refused, fearing such help would ruin the Republican Party's chances of maintaining power in Northern states. So black citizens of Mississippi were murdered in mass political violence and their right to vote 
effectively taken away for the next 90 years. White leaders in other Southern states took note. Then the Mississippi plan worked and so it spread. The evil and violent and anti-democratic blueprint serving to guide other states in the use of political violence to steal the voting rights of black Southerners. What happened to Ethelbert Barksdale, the white editor of the Jackson Clarion, who used his newspaper to organize and effectuate the Mississippi plan? He went on to have a celebrated career, serving two terms in the US House of Representatives. And he paved the way for the 1890 Mississippi plan, a state constitutional amendment that disfranchised black men through the infamous literacy test. Yet another Mississippi anti-black, anti-democratic stratagem that spread across the South. It's important to note that the violent 1875 Mississippi plan helped bring reconstruction, which served as a powerful federal protection for black Southerners to an official end in 1877. It lasted all of 12 years. That's as much as this country could muster for its black citizens. And the Mississippi plan served as a powerful message to the white South and the Democratic Party. They could use wanton violence against their black neighbors to stamp out their constitutional rights, including their political power through the vote and to build white supremacist political, economic and social worlds. When Henry W. Grady became managing editor of the Atlanta Constitution in 1880, Reconstruction was over. Federal troops were no longer in the South to protect black rights and conditions were ripe for a man of Grady's talents to create a blueprint for the entire South to build white supremacy. In the first chapter of Journalism and Jim Crow, I retell the story of Henry W. Grady, who is still celebrated across Georgia and, Atlant and in Atlanta. In the popular narrative, Grady is the progressive managing editor of the Atlanta Constitution who built it into the New South's national voice. He was the most prominent New South spokesman in the country who brought industry to the South and saved it from economic ruin. He championed reconciliation between North and South and made the Union whole. He was a booster and builder of the modern city of Atlanta. He was a political kingmaker who led the Atlanta ring of democratic leaders in a progressive program. And he was merely a mild racist for his era. This popular narrative neglects the anti-democratic and anti-black purposes to which Grady put his newspaper, voice and political machine. And very importantly and tragically, it neglects the voices and work of prominent black journalists and civil rights leaders of Grady's own era, who told a story about Grady, very much like the one I tell in Journalism and Jim Crow. I follow them in my work. And we tell, I tell with their help a more complete and clear-eyed story about who Grady was, because they understood clearly who he was and what he was doing as he was doing it and called him out and tried to stop him. Grady was, I argue, a powerful architect of white supremacy in the South. He played an outsized role in crafting white supremacy in Georgia, the South and the nation during a decade, the 1880s, when the future of liberal democracy in the South and the country hung in the balance. It did not have to be this the way it turned out. And this was the decisive moment. So Grady, in his famous New South speeches across the North and the South, in the pages of his newspaper, the Atlanta Constitution, in his role as political kingmaker in Georgia, provided the intellectual predicate and political blueprint for building white supremacy. He popularized, let me tell you some of the things he did. He popularized that idea, that famous idea you've all learned about of equal but separate enshrined in Plessy v. Ferguson in 1896 as separate but equal, a constitutional doctrine that kept the South segregated until the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Grady advocated endlessly for black disfranchisement, for removing the right to vote from black Southerners, to guard against so-called Negro domination and Negro rule. He used the Atlanta constitution as a propaganda machine 
for a Democratic Party dedicated to building a white supremacist political um, economy and social order. He also normalized racial terror lynchings in the Atlanta Constitution's lynching coverage, setting in place reporting practices that led the paper actually to foment lynchings in the years ahead. Grady was also the leader of the Atlanta Ring, a group of powerful Democrats who controlled Georgia and Atlanta and cycled through the US Senate and governor's office advocating for the new South and white supremacy at the federal level and throughout the state and region. He masterminded a secret corrupt political deal to keep power in the hands of his ring members. And he helped build the single party democratic framework for white political domination known as the solid South. Finally, he laid the groundwork to defeat the federal lodge bill meant to protect black voting rights in federal elections, which led to the 1890 Mississippi plan, which I talked about earlier, and its disfranchisement scheme, which was replicated in other Southern states and lasted until the 1965 Voting Rights Act, making it incredibly difficult for black Southerners to have political power in the South. All of this is Henry W. Grady's legacy the managing editor of the Atlanta Constitution, the voice of the New South across the 1880s. He also, and I'm gonna spend a little time on this because it's very important. He also protected the insidious convict leasing system, which used a loophole in the 13th amendment to criminalize blackness and convict black men, women, and children on trumped up charges like vagrancy and then lease them, not put them in a prison, but lease them as imprisoned people to private industrial concerns where their labor and lives were stolen. All of these men, all of the men in Grady's Atlanta ring, these were the men who were governors. He, he helped get them elected over and over again. The governor of Georgia, uh, the uh, US senators from Georgia to, um, to Washington, a mayor, an Atlanta mayor, he helped get them elected. And all of them were holders of a 20 year convict lease in Georgia. And most of them grew incredibly wealthy by brutalizing the black men, women, and children who were forced to work in their mines and brick making businesses, and also forced to live in inhumane conditions. This is an an incredible part of the Southern story. And I'm so sorry to share what I'm gonna share next with you um, about how the convict leasing system worked. It is incredibly upsetting and traumatizing. Um, and I'm sorry to share it. I'm gonna to try to keep it brief. Before and during the 1880s, Grady, Henry W. Grady went to great lengths in the Atlanta constitution to cover the convict leasing system. And he was well acquainted with its injustices and brutalities because he covered it over and over again. Nevertheless, he defended it over and over again until his premature death in 1889. Many of the historic buildings and areas of Atlanta were built using the products and wealth and labor of the convict leasing system. At Dade Cole, which Senator Joe Brown owned, overseers worked convicts on something called the task system. So if convicts were not able to produce the day's quota of coal in the mines, and there were huge quotas, they were punished. And the punishments were cruel and sadistic. It was in fact an organized system of torture. Prisoners were secured by the legs and waist to one pole with their hands tied to another pole about six feet away. So they were bent at the waist with their backs exposed for flogging with a wide leather whip, which was often dragged first through wet sand so as to take off the skin. This style of whipping was called bucking. Other punishments included the water cure, a form of torture rather like waterboarding, the sweat box, in which a prisoner was locked in a narrow box and left in the sun to bake, and the blind mule. Carrie Massey, a black teenage girl, endured this torture for six hours. Her wrists were tied with rope. She was hoisted by a pole, hoisted um, and pulled up over a ceiling beam until her toes just grazed the ground. She was also sexually assaulted as she bore a child in the camp. James English, Atlanta's mayor and then police commissioner, 
worked convicts at his Chattahoochee brick company on the task system. The brick making process was archaic, using old handmade methods under a modern productivity regime. Convicts filled brick molds by hand with clay. They worked fire breathing kilns and carried pallets of hot bricks on their backs at a run under the lash of guards, wielding horse whips. At its worst, the camp flogged 15 to 20 prisoners a day. Community members would hear blood curdling screams from the camp. In 1885, a Macon newspaper reported the death rate of 20 to 25% at the Chattahoochee camp, noting that the deaths were not due to illness. They were due to accidents and mistreatment. Meanwhile, a legislative penitentiary report the same year reported that convicts across all Georgia camps were in excellent health. That was the official report. The newspaper explained the discrepancy between reports of abuse uh, and the so-called excellence health by noting that public information about the convict leasing system was controlled by influential political rings that included the lessees themselves. And that of course was true. So when Governor Gordon presided, who also at one time held the lease, when he presided over an investigation of the convict leasing system in 1887, it was found that prisoners at the Chattahoochee camp had been flogged so viciously that stripes of flesh had been cut out with the lash from their backs. What was their offense? They had simply reported inhumane treatment to a legislative committee. Grady was well aware of his colleagues' involvement in the convict lease and the brutalities of the system. After all, Gordon's sub lessee had murdered Grady's friend for his attempts to expose convict leasing as an inhumane system. And Grady had covered the entire affair in the Atlanta Constitution. But Grady's knowledge far exceeded his friend's legislative report and, the, and other matters. As a reporter, Grady had developed granular knowledge of government in Georgia and Atlanta and the convict leasing system. The Constitution reported on state government affairs, including the annual penitentiary keepers report, as well as multiple uh, investigations, state investigations of convict abuse. Even before Grady was manager at the Atlanta Constitution, he wrote a report for the Philadelphia Times on Georgia's convict labor system. Grady defended it over and over again. He explained how lucrative it was for the companies with 20 year leases, even though there were these documented brutal treatments of convicts and high death rates. And he, this is what he wrote. The disposition in Georgia is to adhere to the present system as the best for the state and for the Negro. As if he was writing, as if to assure his white readers that most of the convicts were black. Then he wrote, I cannot deny many of the stories of cruelty or of excessive mortality that are told. Most of the reports, however, are colored for sinister effect. So apparently, Grady found nothing truly authentically sinister about a cruel and lethal system targeting black Georgians. Black Georgians and black journalists in the South and in the North fought back against Grady's work. The Reverend William J. White, an editor of the Georgia Baptist in Georgia wrote this, the fortunes of many a prominent white Georgia family are red with the blood and sweat of black men justly and unjustly held to labor in Georgia prison camps. T. Thomas Fortune, who was one of the great black intellectuals of the 19th century and editor of the New York Age, the New York Globe wrote this. He attacked Grady directly, calling Georgia's convict system a cesspool of degradation and crime under the very nostrils of the prophet Grady. He also called Grady the editor of a leading but hidebound Georgia newspaper. And he pointed out the irony of Grady insisting on social separation of the races when, and this is in T. Thomas Fortune's words, the entire African race in this country has not only had its blood tainted, but actually corrupted by unholy contact with his much vaunted superior race. Fortune also rebuked and corrected Grady's arrogant assumption that black people were somehow not included in the we of the South. And this is Grady writing. Grady appeals to the, uh, not Grady, I'm sorry, Fortune. Grady appeals to the North 
to leave the race question to us and we will settle it, Fortune wrote. So we will, but the we Mr. Grady had in his mind's eye will not be permitted to settle it alone. Not by any means, Mr. Grady. Not only the white we, but the colored we as well will demand a share in that settlement. Ida B. Wells, the great journalist um, and anti-lynching advocate in her anti-lynching pamphlet, Southern Horrors, connected the dots from Grady's New South Doctrine to lynching. This is what she wrote. Henry W. Grady, in his well-remembered speeches in New England and New York, pictured the Afro-American as incapable of self-government. Through him and other leading men, the cry of the South to the country has been, hands off, leave us to solve our problem. To the Afro-American, the South says, the white man must and will rule. And then she says, there is little difference between the antebellum South, the South before slavery and the new South. And then she went on in her pamphlet to use lynching coverage from the Atlanta constitution to produce lynch law in Georgia in which she showed and in, in her words that the Southern press champions burning men alive. And she meant the white Southern press. W.E.B. Du Bois, one of the great intellect scholars, activists, and journalists of the late 19th and 20th centuries, had a few things to say about Grady too. He called Grady's New South a phantasmagoria of 5,000 lynchings, jails bursting with black prisoners incarcerated on trivial and trumped up charges, and cast staring from every train and streetcar. He also said that Grady's New South was simply an armed camp for intimidating black folk. This is what black journalists and leaders of Grady's own day said about him. And this was the world Grady helped to build using the soft power of newspaper narratives and the hard power of commercial news institutions enthralled to and entrenched in a white supremacist industrial capitalism working hand in glove with the Democratic Party, absolutely dedicated to racial caste. And it was a word, and it was a world built across the South, almost always with powerful white newspaper editors leading the way. And it was a world many, if not most, powerful white newspaper leaders continued to defend and protect until black Southerners dismantled a great deal of it during the civil rights movement and took their liberty and made America a more democratic and multiracial country. Today in Atlanta, Henry W. Grady is celebrated all over the public landscape. Grady Hospital in Atlanta bears his name. A high school bears his name, although it's changing it. Most stunning of all, in 2021, the College of Journalism and Communication at the University of Georgia bears his name, a college of journalism. Tonight I've talked with you about journalism, democracy, and race during a tragic consequential period in our nation's past. I hope it will help you think in new ways about two important concerns. The complicated relationship between journalism and power in American democracy and the systems and structures of white supremacy in American life. While these subjects may appear to have little to do with one another, they are historically intertwined. The unpleasant truth is that journalism in America has often not been devoted to democratic values. Another unpleasant truth is that many legacy American newspapers and news outlets have much to atone for and much work to do to make their news content and workplaces truly multiracial and diverse. Most newsrooms in the United States continue to be predominantly white. And as the black journalist Wesley Lowry pointed out in a widely discussed New York Times op-ed published at the height of the summer 2020 protests, this largely white press has allowed what it considers objective truth to be decided almost exclusively by white reporters and their mostly white bosses. Such journalism has often ignored or misrepresented black communities, issues, and perspectives. 
It has often, it has also often fallen prey to the perils of mistaking objectivity for neutrality with editors making coverage decisions they believe will appear fair to some imagined white reader. When a public official or figure trots out race, racist rhetoric or supports a public policy that disadvantages people of color, call it racist, Lowry suggests. He also says that when a police officer shoots someone, avoid newspeak like officer involved shooting. Lowry also says, Hire black journalists and other journalists of color and give them positions of power in the newsroom. To his suggestions, I would simply add, news leaders and journalists should learn about the history of white supremacy in American journalism and pull it out by the roots. I wanna thank you all for listening and I look forward to answering your questions. Dr. Ford, that was is just an incredibly powerful uh, lecture and uh, we're just, so grateful for your perspective. It's uh, it's sobering and it's shocking what you what you come up with. Um, and uh, I think that that detail, as uncomfortable as it was, was completely necessary to really give um, you know a foundation to 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 your to your argument here. I have um, want to encourage the audience to um, add questions in the chat. I'll be monitoring it. Um, my, uh, my data journalism students read uh, a couple of your articles and have a number of questions here and I'm gonna to get to them. I just wanted to kick off the, the first question as a, as a historian, you know, to try to talk about the, um, one of the, the central challenges that we face is, you know, try not to impose our values from this era, you know, in 2021 on, on the conduct of, of an earlier era. Can you just walk us through how you address that that problem? Yeah, so it's it's a really interesting. Um, I don't see. I'm not coming up. Is that? No, you're you're, you're coming through. Oh, I am. I am. Okay. Yeah. Um, great. So, hi everybody again. Um, it's a really important question. So historians learn um, and learn as we're trained uh, to take the past as it is and to avoid being presentist. So it's really important that we um, not impose values of the present on the past. But in, in my, and, and so I've, I've uh, heard from a lot of people who think that's exactly what I'm doing <laughs> in this, uh, in the re, revision of history that I'm undertaking with my colleagues in journalism and Jim Crow. And what I say to those who make that argument is, no, we're not. Uh, what we're doing is we're removing the white frame that has been um, used to interpret the past. And in fact, if you look and listen to black journalists of Henry Grady's era, they all, uh, many of them, and all the ones that I quote uh, quoted in my speech today and that we feature in our book, they called Henry Grady out over and over and over again. So why are their voices less reasonable and less of, um, less of a, telling of a historical truth than the white frame, than white people of his era and the white frame. They understood him to be a white supremacist. They understood what he was doing and they called him out for it. And uh, I, I think they were right. Dr. Benton, I know you had a, a couple questions that you wanted to ask as well, please go ahead. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Ford for that uh, fascinating uh, presentation, uh, you know, it reminded me of something that, you know, uh, as a historian, you're probably already familiar with, but uh, I recall back in uh, Hillary Clinton's campaign um, at, a, at a CNN town hall, um, you know, she was asked um, what people thought was a softball question about who was your favorite uh, president? And she answered Abraham Lincoln, um, you know, and she, you know, she said that, you know, Lincoln was willing to reconcile and forgive. And I don't know what our country might have been like had he not been murdered, you know, but I bet it might have been a little less rancorous and a little more forgiving and tolerant that might possibly have brought people back together more quickly, you know, and she said, but instead, you know, we had reconstruction. We had the 
reinstigation of segregation and Jim Crow when we had people in the South feeling totally discouraged and defiant. So I really do believe uh, he could have, you know, been uh, put us on a different path. And you know, his uh, her comments um, revived this very long-standing, um, now discredited idea about reconstruction. Um, you know, part of which you your talk touched upon, and you know, it brought into view um, in our profession the Columbia historian William Archibald Dunning, um, who uh, helped to uh, push that dominant narrative through to the 1960s. Um, that was uh, at odds with people like W.E.B. Du Bois and his work, Black Reconstruction. And so scholars like Eric Foner um, has argued in his own work on Reconstruction that the traditional or done in school of Reconstruction was not just an interpretation of history. It was part of the edifice of Jim Crow, right? It was an explanation for and justification of taking the right to vote away from Black people on the grounds that they uh, completely abused it during Reconstruction. And, to, and it was a justification for the white South resisting outside efforts in changing race relations because of the worry of having another Reconstruction, right? So um, all the alleged horrors of Reconstruction that helped to free the minds of the white South in resistance to any change whatsoever, um, you know, uh, Dunning was a part of, um, as a historian and as an academic, um, we have a lot to answer for, for helping to propagate that kind of race, racist system. And in listening to your work, it seems like for journalists, uh, probably Grady is the Dunning of journalists, would you say? I love that analogy. Um, I, I love it so much. Yeah, so yeah, I think it's so important that you point out that historians, the historian, uh, the practice of history, the professional practice of history in the United States, which was dominated by white people <laughs> of European descent until, you know, to the very recent past, until the, the, the social and cultural turn of the 1950s, 1960s. I mean, of course, I mean, there were very important Black historians working in the late 19th and early 20th century, um, but they often just didn't get the the kind of um, focus that they deserve. I mean, thinking Rayford Logan, John R. Lynch, John R. Lynch from Mississippi, and other many, many others. Um, so this idea that Grady was the dunning of his period, but for journalists, is just so intriguing to me. I haven't, I've not thought of that, and I love it. Um, this Dunning School of Reconstruction was such, it was just a piece and a part and an edifice of white supremacy just in the in the world of higher education and prof professional historical storytelling about what America was. And, and Grady, you know, was a precursor to that, but in the world of journalism. Uh, I know everyone on this, everyone in this, uh, on this uh, lecture, on the Zoom call, everyone has heard uh, that journalism is the first rough draft of history, right? And so, you know, Grady provided a lot of material for the Dunning people to work with, and a great deal of it lies and misinformation, fake news, propaganda, political campaign material. Thank you so much, Dr. Banton. That's such a great insight. And, and, and I, I guess just as a, as a little follow up to that, as you just mentioned it, talking about, you know, historians and the archive, right, that he has provided this, this archive. And, you know, what might you say to, to students, in, you know, who uh, must go back in, you know, to this archive that, you know, to avoid reinscribing the kinds of racist thinking that has been shrouded under this or veiled under this idea of neutrality and objectivity? How do they kind of suss that out? I think it's a real challenge. Um, I think uh, students who work particularly in newspaper archives, uh, they have to understand the historical period in which they were working and they have to understand how newspapers worked in that period. So for example, in the late 19th and early 20th century South, newspapers in America, at least in the South, were still very 
very much tied to political parties. And so they have to understand that. And if they don't understand that, they're gonna assume that these newspapers were somehow working with professional standards of journalism that didn't become standard until the 1920s, 1930s. And even then, when the, the professional standard of objectivity became a norm in professional journalism, even then it was still very much a white norm, right? And so you still have white norms and white standards shaping the stories that journalists, um, I mean, white journalists, like uh, some really powerful newspapers that were read by more Americans and magazines and, and when the, the advent of television news, same, the same thing was happening, right? That often misrepresented people of color um, and pay very little attention to their issues and, and really quite frequently um, presented, um, misrepresented and criminally, in my view, misrepresented um, people of color and particularly black people as criminals. Um, and so you know, I think what, uh, when students do work in the archives and in newspapers, they have to understand <laughs> the nature of those newspapers. They have to really understand who um, if there was a political party attached and, and they've got to look, I mean, I, in doing our research for this book, we looked at newspaper content, but we looked, re we read tons of literature, all as like 360 degree literature and primary sources all the way around that newspaper. So we looked in uh, political reports and legislative reports. We looked in justice department investigations. We looked in court cases. We looked in, um, the personal papers of political actors. We looked at uh, political party campaign books that spelled out these stratagems, just spelled it out. Um, so, and then of course, you know, we, we read a lot of um, written by black journalists and leaders who documented this. Thank you, that was a great question. Yeah, excellent, excellent question. You know, there was um, another faculty member here, uh, 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 Dr. Lucy Brown asked a, a question just a little bit more broadly about the distinction between neutrality and objectivity in journalism and, and how your research kind of illuminates that. Maybe you could address that, that there's distinction between the two. Yeah, you know, it's such a tricky one and um, <laughs> such a tricky one. So the intellectual historian Thomas Haskell wrote this famous book that I'm sure you know about a doctor, um, which is that uh, objectivity is not neutrality. Right, that being ob objectivity is a method. It's a way of um, it, when scientists do it, when historians do it, when journalists do it. That ideally, it's a method. It's not. Um, it's not the same thing as being neutral. That in fact, um, you know, even scientists really should not be neutral, <laughs> because the, the work of science, the work of journalists, the work of historians, we the work work we do, if it matters at all, if it contributes in any way to public understanding, which then might inform public policy, might inform human action, uh, and affect people's lives. If we're neutral, that means we're we don't have a moral valence, um, and that's never okay in life. We have to have a moral valence, and I'm not talking from any position, any political ideological position or um, a religious position. I'm talking about caring about certain human values, human rights, civil rights, political rights. That's what I'm talking about. I don't think journalism standards, I don't think even the, the standard of objectivity has been sufficiently committed to or, or that journalism um, as a profession has done enough soul searching and digging into what it means to um, serve democratic values. I just don't think it has. I mean, if journalism, I think journalism should serve in this country anyway, should serve democratic values. And democratic values are not just about um, making afflict, you know, making the comfortable uncomfortable. It's not just about um, providing information. It's about serving the goals of justice, in my view. I don't think we have a democracy unless we also have justice for everyone under the law, equal protection. And I don't think journalism has been has always thought about those, thought about its, what its professional norms can be in terms of serving democracy. I think it's tricky and I think it's hard, but I think these are conversations we need to have. I mean, obviously we still have large, I mean, we still have very little diversity in our newsrooms. Why is that? It's because people in power haven't been willing to make a commitment to something different, to a different vision and to a, a vision of multiracial democracy. That's why. 
Yeah, I mean, this, you know, the literature on, on, on objectivity just does not address human rights, you know, civil rights, democracy at all. I mean, we, we go through, you know, uh, Shudson's analysis and so forth in our, in our class and, and none of that is in there. Um, I have a question from a, a participant, Ella Marshall here, uh, said the presentation was fantastic. I agree hundred uh, percent. And she says, thank you, Dr. Ford. Has the University of Georgia or the community around it taken steps to try to change the journalism school's name? And especially after the Black Lives Matter movement occurred where the collegiate institutions were under fire for their in internalized racism. Ella, that's, that's a really good question. And thank you for asking it. Um, so this past summer, in the wake of the um, uprisings after the police killing of George Floyd, there was a, um, a group, a student at the University of Georgia published an op-ed in the student newspaper um, saying that the Grady School should change its name um, and it should not be called the Grady College anymore. Um, and then um, a group of alumni started a petition um, using my research, which I'm really pleased about. And by the way, I want to, I'll, I'll get to that. My students helped me with this. I want to talk about my students because my students are the best. Um, and I have involved students in my research um, for this book and they've been pivotal and just really wonderful partners. So um, this, the petition and the movement is called Rename Grady. And uh, so the the um, president of the University of Georgia system appointed this kind of committee to look into the renaming, not only of the Grady College, but all kinds of public buildings across the University of Georgia system. I read a report in the student newspaper not very long ago um, and actually went and looked at the uh, University of Georgia system's website that uh, reports out what this committee is doing. And at least the website reports out that the committee has done nothing since last, when I looked about a month ago, hadn't done anything since September. September. So there are movements afoot. What the University of Georgia is going to do about it, I do not know. Wow. Dr. Benton, did you have uh, other questions that you wanted to ask at this time? Uh, well, you know, I, I except to say that uh, it's a very interesting, as you were talking about, um, and, you know, renaming Grady School and, and thinking about the, you know, the ways in which Jim Crow ideas and white supremacy has been, uh, you know, enshrined in concrete at uh, various uh, institutions, including academic institutions, as you pointed out, University of Georgia, here at the University of Arkansas, as well as we're having these discussion among ourselves with uh, um, J. William Fulbright and um, other uh, 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 people like that connected to that long uh, intellectual history of, of, of Jim Crow that was enshrined by people like Brady. So I was going to ask you a question about how we might trace that intellectual history if, we, uh, if you've identified how the language of, of, of Jim Crow and the ways of, uh, of, of, of enshrining it in our various methodologies and institution has changed over time. Hmm, I'm not sure how to, I'm not sure how to answer that question. Um, I, I, I think I, I, I might have to answer a, a question you didn't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> which, is, uh, which is, by the way, everyone in the audience, that's a way of deflecting when you're not quite sure what to, a to you're, ask. You know, you you're going to start running for office if you keep that up. Yeah, this is called news media training 101. <laughs> when you're not quite sure how to answer the question or you don't want it. In this case, I'm not sure to answer it. It's not that I don't want to answer it. I just don't know. I'm sure I can I have the tools at the moment at the ready to answer it, but it's called the pivot. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm going to try. Um, so institutions, particularly institutions in the South, I think um, they, they have this history, a really difficult history that they have to reckon with. And there are these intellectual, um, these, these intellectual uh, residue that remains in the present, um, these names of people who are on buildings, um, there are, might even be practices in place that um, are inherited from the past that um, aren't inclusive 
that aren't, don't celebrate diversity, that are um, offensive to all kinds of people <laughs> um, and, and students and faculty and staff. Um, in my work um, and in the, I've heard from a number of people who have been working in activism in Georgia, um, folks who, who resist it and they don't want a Grady's name removed because they say, well, he did all these great things. So, you know, we shouldn't, his name shouldn't be removed for these other things. Um, and they see that the argument is often that removing the name is erasing history. And um, that idea I think is quite mistaken. Uh, it's not erased, the history is there. The history cannot be erased. It cannot be erased. And in fact, it's inscribed in the America we have today. Um, and it has caused tremendous trauma to all kinds of people of color um, and to black Americans. And I think that it's the responsibility of all of us, including higher ed institutions all over the country to reckon with it. And you know, removing a name from a public place, removing a statue is not erasing history. Those, in many instances, those statues across the South memorializing the, con the Confederacy or those statues memorializing white supremacists of the 19th century, they were put there to send a message. They were sent there to build a certain kind of community. And um, it's not a community I'm comfortable with. And I doubt, you know, it's, a com it's not a way of life that is um, democratic or multiracial or inclusive or fair or just. So I, I don't think I answered fully your question about how, to, how we um, tease out and trace those intellectual um, threads other than we have, to, we have to be historians and we have to do the work at our own institutions telling the histories of our own institutions. That's hard. Um, in some ways it's probably easier for you know, Georgia to use my research than I think it would be really hard for someone at Georgia to be doing, but you know, other institutions have opened their arms to these kinds of, to historians on their own campuses um, telling the story of the institution, even at the really ugly, ugly parts. So I think it can be done. Just challenging. So, Dr. Ford, we have quite a few of our faculty members in here, and they're asking questions. Uh, Professor Brett Schulte, uh, you might know him. He's a, a you know, a, a studies a literary journalism, just loves oh, yeah. to talk. And he, um, he would say, you know, what Dr. would you say about um, about Southern journalism in the Jim Crow era, and how it reminds you of uh, of rhetoric of the uh, far right wing news outlets? Are they doing anything? new or different or surprising to preserve the white power structure? You know, I've, I've got to tell you, Dr. Schulte, I've had so many, um, Sid and I and my, um, the, my fellow authors in Journalism and Jim Crow, we've had some really interesting discussions. I feel like the right-wing news media sphere during the Trump administration, um, and not to be political here, y'all, but the, um, the right, the right wing news ecosystem was rife with, uh, with disinformation, political disinformation and uh, very purposeful political disinformation campaign. So in this way, some of these um, right wing news media were seemed to be um, and were quite visibly working with the, um, with the Trumpian wing of the Republican party and so I mean, I, I, there's just a lot of similarities. I don't know about anything different, but a lot of similarities with the past. I'm sorry to say. Yeah. Yeah, it was definitely an, an effort to discredit a, a, a free and fair election. That's right. Uh, without a doubt. And, uh, yeah, talk that, about that's a, one specific thing we can talk about and should. <laughs> that's a nice, a, a clear focus. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of my, a couple of my students were really interested in, in the method of your research. You know, how do you keep everything organized? You know, <laughs> how do you, how do you, um, you know, what sort of system do you use with archival research and pulling it together and, and pulling those needles out of the haystacks? 
So a couple of my students uh, were really interested in, in your process. Well, Dr. Wells and Dr. Banton and many others on this uh, it could, could answer that just as well as I can. Um, and I'm sure we all have really different systems. We should have a meeting. I would love to have a meeting of minds where we, that's all we come and talk about is like our own like crazy, wacky, quirky systems of maintaining all of the copious, voluminous materials we find because it's hard. Sign, sign me up. I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Batten, I hope you're invited. I hope you come and teach me something. And Dr. Schulte and everybody else out there who's done this. Um, so anytime in, I'm in an archive, and by an archive, I mean in working in someone's personal papers or in scrapbook collections, or I'm in a library somewhere working in a special collections, that's a very particular kind of work. And I take copious, incredibly careful notes. Um, and at the same time, I get copies of any document um, and collate it along with my notes. Um, and then I pull it all together in files and save it all very, very carefully. So, and then save it in multiple locations in case there's some kind of uh, technological disaster. So that's one thing. That's just working in archives and pulling that material together. Then when I work in newspaper materials, which um, I might be working in an actual archive, right? In a library setting, I might be working in a digital archive. I might be working on microfilm. Um, I, again, I make copies of things that I find important. Um, and then I also take very careful copious notes. So then I'll, so it, and then I have, you know, I, I keep copies of, um, when I work in microfilm. So for example, for one of the studies I did in this book, I worked in thousands of documents, um, in the justice department peonage files from, um, the early 20th century thousands of documents. And so I saved it all. Um, I took images of it all and saved it all. And uh, then I took notes on, I took notes on everything that mattered. And then on those, from those notes, I mean, I just have multiple, mul so I have Excel documents, I have multiple Word documents where I'm distilling notes and taking notes. And then when I begin organizing all the material, it's just this, I mean, I wish I could tell you that there is some kind of, you know, logical, clear uh, process or guidelines or um, method, but so much of it is taking notes, um, kind of like coding and qualitative research for anyone who's learned that. But I mean, you just know where all the material is and all the themes, and then you begin putting it in buckets. And at this, anytime I'm putting it in different buckets of, of information and different stories that I think are important or from pieces, pieces of the historical narrative that I know are important. That's, I be, then begin dividing it into different things, but at the same time, I'm always keeping track of where everything is from and keeping the notes because our, we have to be true to our sources. We have to always be able to document our sources. I'm sorry, y'all, that was a really boring answer. No, that's, that's a great <laughs> thing. I, I just can't that's help massive, myself. Massive files. I, I, I can't help myself because I'm I, I, I love doing archival research. I love doing historical research. And, and my three tips, one, go out and buy a fresh external hard drive. Go <laughs> yes. out, just buy a brand new one and that's just gonna be your project and, and, and get a terabyte, multi-terabyte yep. drive. Yes. Second one, put up put cam scanner onto your phone. Yep. I use scanner on my phone too. Cam I do scanner the same thing. And, uh, and, and get a little tripod with a, um, with a iPhone holder so you can go and and make multiple copies of your stuff. And then, then what I'm, I do is I just, when I'm writing, I try to write it as I would imagine it in the final product. I'm trying to write my notes in ways that could be served for the, for the final product. So uh, that was an Ira Chinoy uh, tip, who's a great historian at uh, university. That's with, great. Uh, I want to take that one because I'm not sure yeah. I did that very well. <laughs> yeah, he's Ira's. Uh, Ira's too much. You know, we've gone over our uh, our one hour here, and um, we've we've covered a lot of territory. I just want to see if um, is there anything else that Dr. Benton wanted to ask at this point. Um, uh, no, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Ford did such a wonderful job in, you know, covering um, the depth and breadth of uh, Jim Crow and, you know, answering additional um, questions in the, the, the Q&A, but I, I found, you know, what she's uh, said uh, in terms of us living in the wake of Jim Crow 
um, in these institutions, especially in the geographical space of the South, um, you know, and, and, and grappling with this history, this very weighty history to be especially um, instructive. And I, I want to thank her um, for um, bringing that to our students and, to, you know, um, having them think about it. Thank you. Well, thank, yeah, thank you very much for, for, for co-sponsoring and, and getting the word out with, with, your, with your group. Um, Dr. Ford, I, um, when, if we were in person, I would be able to uh, hand you a little uh, token of our appreciation here, but I, I went down to Dixon Street Bookstores today, which always has what I want, and they have two Roy Reed books, brand new. They're, we have the uh, Looking Back at the, at the Arkansas Gazette, uh, which is a, a fine piece. And then his, um, his memoir about being at the New York Times, Beware of Limbo Dancers. And so <laughs> these are gonna be coming to you. Um, That's exciting. And yeah, they're, they're, they're really great. I put um, a, a sheet on in the chat for everybody to uh, begin to explore a jumping off point to explore the work of Roy Reed and, and, and Dr. Kathy Roberts Ford. And uh, the, that link is in, in the chat. So please go ahead and grab it. Um, but thank you very much again for, for taking time and uh, presenting this, this incredibly informative uh, lecture. We're really, really grateful. I wanna thank all of y'all for being here. It's just been a complete pleasure. And uh, all you students, um, college is just such a, an opportunity and a, and an enriching part of life. I'm sorry that part of yours has been taken over by COVID, but I think we're coming out of it. And um, y'all have some great professors here. Y'all are really lucky. Yeah, we got a good school. I'm proud of it. <laughs> so uh, thanks again. We're going to have a recording of this up on our website. It's also going to be distributed to the uh, University of Massachusetts Amherst. And I think we're going to try to get it on our, on our campus TV station. So um, wow. It'll be, yeah, this is important. So anyway, thank you all for joining us. Really appreciate it. And uh, Dr. Ford, good night. <laughs> Bye y'all. Good night, everybody. <laughs>